quiet. It's too quiet. Thank God we have five million different five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary articles to get us through it. Yesterday was the day everybody pretty much gave themselves the day off. Even Trump's social media went into reruns and reposts. More enraged attacks on Nikki Haley. More of the new Trump 2024 God Con with links to propaganda with headlines like his truth is marching on. Trump had one new reality optional dementia driven claim in which he says he has, quote, beaten the once very popular sitting governor of Iowa. I can't swear to this, but I believe the last sitting Republican governor of Iowa to seek the presidential nomination was Governor Albert Cummins in 1912. If Trump thinks he ran against Governor Albert Cummins in 1912 and beat him, his dementia or his CTE or his syphilis is further along than any of us could have possibly dreamed. The American media political industrial complex also slept in, both sizing Trump's dementia and Biden's age is exhausting after all. Strained lying always is. Even Matt Drudge, who now impossibly is one of the good guys, largely took the day off from pummeling Trump. CNN was still live from this New Hampshire diner at 12.59 p.m., and the post-show meeting will be about how terrific the lighting was. Great job, everyone! The biggest political development yesterday was a shock on many levels. Jon Stewart is returning to The Daily Show, hosting on Mondays, executive producing through the election and maybe beyond... Firstly, this comes as a surprise to many of us who did not know The Daily Show was still on the air. Secondly, I have a lot of problems with Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is still mad at me because I did not stay home from work at MSNBC one day in 2003 when I was just getting the show started to instead be a guest on The Daily Show. If you think this is an odd thing to still be mad at somebody about 20 and a half years later, you don't know Jon Stewart! Regardless, this, sadly, seriously, is war. And it is almost entirely, and hopefully will remain only, a media war. I got a lot of problems with Maddo, too. I, I don't know, have I ever mentioned any of them? But two years ago, I actually sent her a note pleading with her not to cut back to one day a week, but to take a sabbatical of a year or even two and return full time as the 2024 primary season began. The saving grace of the left is that while no Republican hates any Democrat as much as he hates some other Republican, Dems and Libs are actually kind of the big tent we claim to be. Stewart sees the existential threat to American democracy that Trump represents. Maddow sees the existential threat to American democracy that Trump represents. They have fan bases and platforms, and therefore, the more they are on TV, I say, the better. I mean, I did just also say Matt Drudge, who now impossibly is one of the good guys. Happily, into this news doldrum breach stepped many of America's best both sidesists. The New York Times was good enough to publish Maggie Haberman and Jonathan Swan's five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. Aaron Blake of the Washington Post offered five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. Conversely, The Hill presented five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. CNN, meanwhile, offered five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. But broadening out the picture just a little bit, Barron's, more of a business publication, published, originating from the Agence France Press, five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. So, here are five takeaways from the five, five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary. Takeaway number one, why the hell is it always five takeaways? To stand out. Just in the journalistic takeaways space, all the New York Times or Agence France Press has to do is switch to four takeaways or to six takeaways or to 206 takeaways and they would crush the other takeaway bastards like grapes. Takeaway number two, 
nobody writing American political analysis for a mainstream legacy site or network or newspaper or magazine anywhere in the world apparently reads anybody else's political analysis, or they would realize just how stupid publishing exactly the same title over what is supposed to be the premium value of your analyst's insight is. I mean, when the Agence France Press and The Hill are both stuck on this cliched formulaic gobbledygook that was outdated when Teddy Roosevelt fought Albert Cummins and Taft for the 1912 Republican nomination, the system is broken. Takeaway number three, every one of these sets of five takeaways included the clock is ticking on Nikki Haley's campaign. Gee, that's wonderful. Thanks. Clock is ticking. That's kind of the point. The clock is ticking on Trump's life and my life and yours. And I'm sorry if this is somehow a surprise that I'm breaking to you. In fact, the clock is ticking on everything in life except, it seems, on the mindless insistence of news organizations to continue running pieces called Five Takeaways from the New Hampshire Primary. Takeaway number four. All five of the five five takeaways provided more opportunity for their encrusted institutions to pray at the altar of both sidesism and at the altar of the use of euphemism at a time of crisis when hard facts and real language are essential. All tiptoed around the actual takeaway. Trump lost his mind after Nikki Haley did not humiliate herself and signed up for the kind of involuntary Trumpian servitude that Tim Scott signed up for. The Washington Post actually wrote, Haley is staying in for now, which Trump appeared angry about. Really? He threatened her. He threatened those who endorsed her. His flying monkey Marjorie Taylor Greene demanded that Haley's team be imprisoned, appeared, appeared to be angry. The Hill actually wrote, primary season looks short and drama free. I guess, unless you think 91 indictments of the front runner, including for the components of treason and threats of violence against and prosecution of those who challenge him, unless you think any of that constitutes drama. I'll give CNN rare credit. They used a good word to describe Trump's insanity. He, quote, seethed and mocked, seethed. And then CNN gave that credit right back. Quote, Trump sounded annoyed. Christ. Can you just write what happened? In Iowa, Trump swallowed his only real human emotion, rage, and at least said words that, when said by other people, would seem mildly gracious. In New Hampshire... He got up and swore at Nikki Haley and her supporters and threatened them. And you could see the red in his face through the orange on his face. Even Politico reported that after Trump lost it at a moment that actually required him to fake being sane, a Haley campaigner asked them, quote, why is he so angry? For someone who's not threatened by Nikki, he sure talks about her every chance he gets. Politico added that a Biden campaign aide then texted, about Trump's outbursts, quote, that's the guy we will beat. And that, of course, is the true takeaway. The thin veneer of human-like conduct Trump slathers on every morning, along with his Rustolium number 245221 hairspray, now vanishes instantly at the slightest pressure. He is, as the psychology professionals say, coming unglued. That's the takeaway. And takeaway number five, I don't want to leave the impression that the Times, the Post, the Hill, CNN, and Agence France Press are the lone culprits here. A Google search for five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary, in quotes, produces 51,200 results. About 13,000 of them are individual public radio and TV websites from KYUK K yuck in Alaska to C SPAN, which reposted NPR's five takeaways from the New Hampshire primary by Domenico Montanaro, whose first takeaway was, God bless him, the clock is ticking on Nikki Haley's campaign. 
The internet is infinite. And so are the five takeaways. Actually, here I will follow my own advice and stretch the takeaway boundaries in a form never before seen nor heard in the English language. I hold in my hand my sixth takeaway. My sixth takeaway is that the real takeaways are Trump lost his mind. Tim Scott is not only a bigger clown than Ramaswamy, but if you saw him on stage with Trump, you have to have noticed that he breathes through his mouth. Marge Green says she's purging the GOP of all non-MAGA, and she doesn't understand that means Trump will get fewer votes because she's stupid or stoned or both. Trump is pressuring Haley to drop out now and using all his minions to do so, but Haley is staying in in case Trump begins speaking in tongues or does an El Presidente Esposito and announces we all have to change our underwear every half hour and wear it on the outside so he can check. Of course, none of the takeaways could manage to come out and say any of my takeaways because... Such actual insight is not permitted in the official AP style book for five takeaways. Oh, and I have a seventh takeaway. Quick, the smelling salts. Dana Bash just fainted. My seventh takeaway is use the term as a verb. This useless institutional promoting artery hardening format. Take it away. Happily, the media has learned its lesson, Senator Collins. 5.04 p.m. Eastern yesterday, Washington Post campaign newsletter, Trump's early wins come with warning signs. 11 minutes later, New York Times campaign newsletter, Trump's New Hampshire win suggests trouble ahead. This is a recording. Before I get back to beating them up, let's run through the other headlines. Looks like Senate Republicans are getting ready to sell out Ukraine. Punchbowl News reports that Mitch McConnell told a closed-door meeting of his coven, quote, When we started this, the border united us and Ukraine divided us. The politics on this have changed. Punchbowl says McConnell referred to Trump as the nominee and added, We don't want to do anything to undermine him. We're in a quandary. No. The people of Ukraine fighting the Russians there so we don't have to fight the Russians in Warsaw or Berlin. The people of Ukraine are in a quandary. You are in danger of losing your immortal souls, you Republican senatorial bastards. Also, remember two weeks ago when I suggested here that maybe Madison Cawthorn was right and the insanity of the Republican Party was actually easily explained, that they really were all just strung out on drugs? Turns out three days before I said that, the Department of Defense Inspector General's office released an 80-page report on the White House Medical Unit and Pharmacy covering the years 2009 through 2019, but focused on the years 2017 through 2019 under Trump. As Rolling Stone summarized it, the report showed that drugs, especially uppers and downers, were handed out like candy, especially after Trump took over. No oversight, no coherent records, no hesitation to give out medications without prescriptions, usually in advance of overseas trips to White House staffers who were ineligible for them. In three years, the Trump White House bought at face value, nearly $50,000 worth of brand name Ambien. If this sounds vaguely familiar, note that time frame, 2009 through 2019. Well, guess who joined the White House Medical Unit in 2006? Dr. Ronnie Jackson. Guess who became director in 2010? Oh, again, Dr. Ronnie Jackson. And guess who became physician to the president in 2013? Dr. Ronnie Jackson. After widespread allegations of drunkenness and harassment, he was finally forced out in 2019 and forced to serve in the House of Representatives. This next one would be a wild story if it were not about Arizona and Carrie Lake. She just successfully blackmailed the state Republican chairman into resigning. So says Jeff DeWitt. He says he has quit. He has resigned because Carrie Lake released an audio tape in which he is heard offering her lucrative job opportunities to just 
get the hell out of politics for just two years. He says she has threatened him with another audio tape. He says he doesn't know what might be on it, so he quit. The UAW endorsed Biden. Wait, that's just the start. In his speech endorsing the president, UAW president Sean Fain called Trump a scab. Then he went on Fox and said, Nowhere in history has Donald Trump ever stood for the American worker. He stands against pretty much everything that we stand for. Sean Fain. Sinn Fein. Sean Fein. Sinn Fein. I keep thinking this is not a coincidence. Only Sean Fein is clearly tougher. And because my bile is still surging, let's go back for some more media bashing with three of the worst takes of the entire 2023-24 campaign year, and all of them are this week, about New Hampshire. Kellyanne Conn job on Fox, just as Trump is getting up to the podium after winning New Hampshire, he'll be gracious to Haley. Sean Hannity then says, his tone, his pitch, his cadence shows he's been really dialed in in a way I've not seen since 2020. When you stop, as I do, and wonder how this insane, brain-damaged, half-human incubus could come to dominate American politics, I mean, just calm yourself and think of how very stupid the people are who support him. After nine years of this, Kellyanne Conway and Sean Hannity expected him to turn human. Okay, that's one. Here's a beauty. Alex Salmon descending down the liberal media game of shoots and ladders from the New Republic to Mother Jones to American Prospect to Slate. Tuesday morning at Slate, morning of the New Hampshire primary, publishes... Democrats got themselves a big old mess in New Hampshire. Biden snubbed New Hampshire. Now the state is poised to embarrass him right back. And he wrote, Biden, with his record low approval ratings and miserable head-to-head polls, is hardly in a position to weather even a symbolic loss. It's unlikely that a ceasefire write-in vote will topple Biden, but the campaign seems like a meaningful way to register discontent with Biden's policies. Biden got two-thirds of the votes in New Hampshire. Not on the ballot, two-thirds of the votes all right in. We do not yet have the breakdown of all of the 6,300 or so non-Biden write-in votes in that state, but in Nashua, New Hampshire, Biden got 4,134 write-in votes. Ceasefire got 46. 46. We do know that all the non-Biden write-in combined just edged out Marianne Williamson. Marianne Williamson. On the other hand, Mr. Salmon's take was right about the town of Hill, New Hampshire, 1,100 residents, and there, Dean Phillips humiliated Joe Biden, 30 votes to 29. It's a final. So far, that is the only locality in the entire state that we are sure Biden did not win. 30 to 29. You know, if you get fired from Slate, the next job is writing graffiti. Still, saving Mr. Salmon from worst take about New Hampshire, Abby Phillip of CNN. She is apparently adored by Washington insiders. CNN gave her her own show at 10 p.m. last year. I know, you didn't hear about that, did you? It's the show they preempt once a week to instead run Charles Barkley and Gail King, which should tell you everything you need to know about Abby Phillip. Yet there was more to tell. This was her take Tuesday night. I'll remind you, this is ostensibly a news anchor, a CNN anchor. You know, and and so, you know, as Nikki Haley put it, I think it's actually such a smart way to put it. Maybe the first person to let, the first party to let go of their 80-year-old might be the victor, but who's going to be the one to move first? Yeah. And I think that's where that's where we are as a country, and that's why this is kind of such an intractable problem. Nobody wants Trump, nobody wants Biden, but nobody wants to be the very, the first to walk away from either. I'd be startled at Abby Phillips' amazing combination of condescension and inaccuracy and right-wing trash. But this is CNN. 
By the way, Monday's cable ratings are the most recent ones out. And the Abby Phillip program is literally the second lowest rated show in primetime in cable news. She had what was for her a strong night Monday night, nearly one third of the audience of Lawrence O'Donnell. She had 93,000 viewers in the 25 to 54 advertising demo. She has a national TV show with a staff and a green room and coffee, and her demo audience is 20% smaller than the daily audience of this podcast, which I do by myself in my spare time. Not only do they preempt her once a week for Charles Barkley and Gail King, but when they do, Barkley and King get ratings 20% higher than hers. I have no idea why. Also of interest here, so how did the state Senate elect a guy who was about to be arrested as a charged January 6th Trump election denier insurrectionist? How did they elect him onto their state board of elections? Well, apparently the answer is they never asked him about January 6th. Holy crap. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Oberman. Head on countdown since we began this episode with the overwhelming and possibly invincible truth of both sidesism. Just another of the many default positions in journalism that favor Trump and fascism and the denial that anything important is actually at risk. I'm going to devote today's things I promised not to tell to the answer to this question Which of the following cable news channels? has never suddenly lurched to the far right in hopes that it could get more fascists watching. A. Fox B. CNN or C. MSNBC Well, of course, it's a trick question. The answer is D. None of them have never done that. All of them have gone far right. The saga of the day MSNBC tried to move to the right of Fox News. The Michael Savage saga. Next. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, worse, Frank Farian, the German music producer behind the group Millie Vanilli the duo that had three number one singles in 1989 until one day at a concert in, of all places, Bristol, Connecticut. Hello. The record they were lip syncing to skipped and it kept repeating, girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's. And one of the members of the duo fled from the stage in panic. Yet it was not until after Millie Vanilli took home the Grammy for the best new artists that the scam was revealed. Not only were they not singing, but it wasn't even them on the record they were lip syncing to. Anyway, the producer at the heart of this, Mr. Farian, he's dead. Is it unfair to put a guy on the worst person's list when he dies? Yes, yes it is. But when else would I get the chance to tell that great story again? Frank Farian was 82 years old when he died in Miami. Or was he? The runners-up, Worser, News Nation, the right-wing TV network that pretends to be neutral and above the fray, and it's actually right-wing, and it's actually just the nick at night for cable news hosts. Dan Abrams, Elizabeth Vargas, Chris Cuomo. It also pretends to have viewers. It doesn't but now it has launched News Nation Audio, in which it will take important sound bites from its beloved newscasts and offer them to participating radio stations around the country. So now you have two News Nation options. You cannot watch it on TV, and you cannot listen to it on the radio. 
But the winner, the worst, the state Senate of Maryland and President Bill Ferguson, Democrat from Baltimore. There is a lot of introspection in the state Senate right now. And when you hear politicians use the word introspection, they mean panic. Last year, Carlos Ayala got broad bipartisan support. People noted whimsically that he used to be a vice president at Purdue Farms, and his mother used to be married to Frank Purdue, the frozen chicken king who used to do his own TV commercials because bluntly he looked like a chicken. Mr. Ayala then sailed through a confirmation hearing, and he was added to the Maryland State Board of Elections last year. Then, last month, Mr. Ayala was arrested by the FBI on felony and misdemeanor charges because the new member of the Maryland State Board of Elections is being prosecuted for his role in January 6th. Video and testimony shows Ayala in a huge painter's mask carrying a flagpole with the word defend and an image of an M16 on it, climbing over the police barricades on January 6th, going into the Capitol on January 6th, jabbing the flagpole at Capitol Police officers on January 6th. Now, what was January 6th about again? Oh, yeah! Trying to prove a legitimate election had been stolen from a lying sack of shit would-be dictator. Well... Well, yeah, well, this Ayala has considerable experience in election issues, and, and, and chicken, he'd be great. The Maryland Democrats who supported him are all on record now with basically some variation of the same quote. We don't know how this could have happened. We will try to find new methods of blah, 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 blah. Well, you could have asked him, or you could have Googled him. Turns out they never asked him. The Maryland State Senate... By the way, Ayala resigned from the state election board after he was arrested. Hey, maybe you guys, you got an opening. Maybe you could replace him with this Mike Lindell guy. He seems nice. Today's worst persons in the Number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic, me and things I promised not to tell. And who boy, they're all still at it in cable news, huh? Still hoping they'll wake up tomorrow and it'll be 2005 again. And everybody watches one of the channels and hundreds of millions of dollars are just waiting to be made. And our industry is not dying. It's not, it's not, it's not. I'll repeat my point about the desperate attempts at CNN and MSNBC, and the minor ones, to court right-wing viewers. I mean, once again, I'll mention the name Abby Phillip. This is no boating accident. Virtually every mainstream media organization in this country, as I have said time and time again, has already had the same meeting. Let's now discuss how, if Trump seizes power again and America goes fully fascist in 2025, how can we do the most important thing that journalism demands? How can we still protect this company's profits? I say this not merely because I know most of the people running the mainstream media organizations, but because these conversations have already happened and they happened long ago. Largely because the first not-white-guy president was elected just seven years and two months after 9-11. We forget how seriously and terrifyingly we already have teetered on the edge of full-fledged fascism here after the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. 9-11 happened between my two tenures at MSNBC, but I returned a year and a half after it happened. And by then, the place I went back to work had already hired a sort of Alex Jones prototype radio host named Michael Savage, and it was slowly trying to build him into the host of a weeknight show. Savage was a homophobe plus an equal opportunity bigot. His real name was Michael Weiner, and all you need to know about him is that he was a Weiner who pretended he was a savage. What happened to him when they tried to stick him into prime time and what he said that led to his firing and the blowing up of the let's out Fox Fox News plan of the then NBC chairman and CEO Bob Wright is a great story I will relish telling you in a moment. But first, 
a little context to this. MSNBC and Fox News launched within weeks of each other in 1996. And for a while, in fact, until I left MSNBC in December 1998, we were ahead of Fox in many time periods, though CNN crushed us both. Then Fox ascended, then came 9-11, and then Bob Wright thought he saw his opportunity. All you need to know about him is that after he left the position of running NBC, he became a contributor to Fox Business. At MSNBC, Wright gave Oliver North his own show and Laura Ingram her own show. He had given a program to Alan Keyes, a Republican who somehow managed to lose Senate races in two different states and washed out three different times in Republican presidential primaries. His MSNBC show consisted of him giving speeches. Though he was alone in a studio with no audience, Alan Keyes could not break himself of his habit of spraying the room with his eyes. The viewer at home would see him looking off camera to his left, then looking at the camera, then looking off camera to the right. He went back and forth like a sprinkler. I remember once looking at him and yelling at the TV, Hey, Al! Over here, I'm the one in the middle. Bob Wright also brought in Joe Scarborough, long before Scarborough knew how to disguise much of his fascism. Bob Wright fired Phil Donahue, although to be fair, that was really more about money than it was about politics. But he replaced Donahue's show with what was supposed to be a high-speed, slightly right-leaning newscast produced by a Fox News refugee. It was called Countdown with Sam Donaldson. And needless to say, the right-leaning idea went horribly, horribly wrong after they changed it to Countdown with Keith Olbermann. MSNBC's lineup was remarkably unstable at that time. I had hosted its 8 p.m. show from October 1st, 1997 through the beginning of December 1998, and then I left to go back to sports and baseball at Fox. Then the 8 p.m. hour was hosted by John Hockenberry for three months. Then Ollie North got his shot. A month later, they started having rotating liberals co-host with Ollie North. In April 1999, it became North and Paul Begala. That was five shows in five months. In May, they cut North and Begala to half an hour. In June, they canceled them and replaced them with a half-hour Ann Curry documentary. In early 2000, Curry was expanded to an hour. But then in May, Curry was replaced by Lori Dew. In August 2000, they started their version of Dateline called MSNBC Investigates. In September, they cut that show to four days a week and launched a vanished white woman of the week show actually called Missing Persons with Diane Diamond, which they canceled after one episode. And then they put MSNBC Investigates back on. Then they canceled that a month later to make room for a newscast with Forrest Sawyer. Then after the uncertainty of the 2000 election, they refocused that as Decision 2000 with Forrest Sawyer. In January 2001, they canceled Forrest Sawyer and put MSNBC Investigates back on for the third different time. Then in July, they moved the news with Brian Williams from 9 p.m. to 8 p.m. Then the next September, they moved Brian to CNBC and instead launched Phil Donahue's show in the 8 p.m. MSNBC slot. Then in March 2003, they off Donahue. They started Countdown originally with Lester Holt, Pat Buchanan, and Bill Press. Then after the war started and there wasn't anything to count down to anymore, they hired me to host Operation Iraqi Freedom. And after one week of that show, they launched Countdown with Keith Olbermann. That's 20 different shows or formats in four years and four months. So Bob Wright's next primetime ideas, and you got to give him this much, He had a lot of primetime ideas, and virtually all of them made it onto TV. His next set of ideas was a primetime lineup of me doing the news at 8, then Scarborough at 9, then Jesse Ventura at 10, and then this Michael Savage character. They began this plot by giving Savage his own show an hour every Saturday afternoon on March 8, 2003. Everybody agreed it was crap. On radio... Savage sounded kind of threatening, I guess, a kind of red meat fascist. But on TV, taking calls from viewers in a tiny little cramped looking studio somewhere in the Bay Area, he looked small and whiny and kvetchy, and he was wearing a bad toupee and a suit that was far worse than that. When I was negotiating my return to MSNBC in 2003, I got the executive in charge of primetime to put it in my contract that Michael Savage would never appear on my newscast in any form unless it was an obituary. 
open and shut. But then on Friday, April 25th, 2003, I came into work. We were about a month into the show. And there in the computer rundown of my newscast was a pre-recorded Michael Savage commentary. As soon as he saw I was in the office, the executive producer they had hired from Fox, a cross-eyed chain smoker named Dennis Murray, pushed his way into my office and said, we have to run a Michael Savage commentary. There's also a mandatory Matt Drudge soundbite. This is per Phil Griffin, so don't think you can call Phil to get it dropped. He's not in New York. He's not reachable. And he left. I called my agent. I told her the story, and I matter-of-factly asked, if they don't drop it, I have to walk out, don't I? Mind you, she had just exhausted herself negotiating my extremely unlikely return to MSNBC. She didn't flinch. Of course you have to walk out. But first, call Phil Griffin's office and tell him you're leaving. Give him a chance. It'll help when you sue them. It was breach of contract. I find dramatic, life-changing, and potentially costly stuff like that is usually way easier if you have the high moral ground. So I called Griffin's office. His assistant said he was in Washington in meetings and could not be reached. I said, well, you should reach somebody there. Tell them, I just called a car to take me home because my contract says you can't put Michael effing Savage on my newscast and somebody just did. Nice working with you all and tell Phil to give me a call sometime. Sometime was three minutes later. Griffin, who frequently panicked, outdid himself on this call. You, you, you would really walk out, buddy? I said it was in the contract. I was putting my pens and books in a box as we spoke. Uh, 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 uh. I told him he was repeating himself. Finally, he said, okay, uh, okay, uh, uh, okay, buddy. C can you just, can you look at the commentary and, and find me a reason, uh, 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 a reason that isn't about politics, uh, why it shouldn't run? I said, you mean like video quality or racist language or something? Phil Griffin's voice brightened. Yeah, good, racist language or something. That'd be great. Call me back. The executive producer and I went to the video edit suite where a guy named Brendan O'Melia was cutting out the time Savage had stumbled or flubbed while recording this nonsense. First of all, I said to the ex-Fox guy who was the producer, Michael Savage is wearing a brown shirt and a brown tie on top of his brown shirt. He is literally dressed like a Hitler brown shirt. The editor, Omelia, played the whole video for me, and as I dialed Phil Griffin's cell, I started laughing. I said, even for racist, homophobic crap, this thing makes no sense. He just keeps saying, George W. Bush is right because George W. Bush, because he's right. He looks small and whiny and convection. and he's got a bad toupee and a worse suit. We wouldn't run this as a soundbite in his obituary, and the lighting is terrible, and he's dressed as a brown shirt. Apparently that was enough. Phil Griffin ordered the piece dropped from my show. I think they ran it on Scarborough show at 9 p.m. In fact, I think I might be wrong. They ran two or three savage commentaries on Scarborough shows. I know they intended to. God knows I never watched Scarborough show. Happily, this was about the time Michael Savage ended his own TV career. On Saturday, July 5th, 2003, show 15 out of a series of checks notes, 15... Michael Savage was on the air live on MSNBC when a caller baited him about gays. Savage replied, quote, so you're one of them sodomists. Are you a sodomite? The caller said, yes. Oh, you're one of them sodomites. Continuing the quote, you should only get AIDS and die, you pig. How's that? Why don't you see if you can sue me, you pig? You got nothing better to put me down, you piece of garbage. You have nothing better to do today. Go eat a sausage and choke on it. Get trichinosis. End quote and Michael Savage. And by the way, that quote that I just read, that was way better than the commentary they had had him record for Countdown. Two days later on Monday, Eric Sorensen, the president of MSNBC, and he was president of all the boring things Bob Wright didn't want to be bothered with at MSNBC, Eric Sorensen fired Michael Savage. Sorensen, for whom I worked in Los Angeles in local news and who consulted on my show on current TV as recently as 2011, took me for a drink because he needed to tell somebody what happened next after he fired Michael Savage. As soon as the Savage firing was announced, Sorensen said, the phone rang in his office and it was Bob Wright, the chairman of NBC. Did you have to fire him, Eric? Wright asked in his nasal Long Island accent. And Sorensen said, he answered, yes. I literally had to. I had to fire him. Remember the clause in his contract? 
There are 40 phrases he's not allowed to use on the show. It literally says if you say any of the following 40 things, you will be automatically fired for cause and get no money. Remember? Remember what number four on that list is? Number four is, quote, I hope you get AIDS and die, unquote. And then he said, I hope you get AIDS and die. Bob, I literally had to fire him. I had to fire him. It's in the contract. Eric Sorensen told me there was a long pause on the other end of the phone. And then Bob Wright said, in anticipation of all that we have seen in television news since, all the meetings about what happens if the country goes fully fascist and NBC and CNN and CBS and ABC all want to protect their profits and do the devil's work. Bob Wright said after a long pause to Eric Sorensen, who had just fired Michael Savage because it was in the contract, Bob Wright said softly and sadly, but Eric, did you have to fire him? But did you have to fire him? I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. And the music was produced by TKO Brothers and by me pushing a button on this machine. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Stevie Van Zandt. Everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's Countdown for this, the 286th day until the 2024 U.S. presidential election and the 1,115th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system. Use the mental health care system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletin says the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.